Good morning, students. I'm Mr. Boscarini, and for our unit on exploring contact and non-contact forces, today we're going to explain static charge. Uh, in the previous lesson, we have investigated a strange new phenomenon, st static charge. We saw what happens when we rub a balloon against your hair or in general against any kind of uh, woolly material, including uh, of course, wool. Uh, and th this, what happens is that object now has the property of attracting other materials, like small pieces of paper has the ability of attracting a soda can or bending uh, a very thin stream of water coming from your tap. Today, we're going to see how we can explain static charge. And as you can already read here, we're going to try to explain it in terms of what we call electron transfer. And of course, once we introduce this, we're going to see how we can apply this ex explanation to different examples. To explain what is static charge and how it happens, we have to go deep. We have to go to almost the basic building blocks of matter. You know that ordinary matter, so all objects which are around you, you included, are made of tiny parts called atoms. You should also know that in nature there are about 90 different types of atoms. Um, but what is interesting for us from a point of view of static charge is not the atom per se, but what is inside the atom, okay? And just to explain, and this will be a bit of a, a more advanced kind of explanation uh, with respect to the usual, uh, we're going to use a specific atom. We're going to use the carbon atom. Uh, the, the symbol is big C, which is pictured here. Now, before I start, a very, very important notice. Um, this is a model. It's a way of representing the atom, which is helpful to some extent, but is by no means how an atom really looks like. First of all, uh, protons are not red, neutrons are not black, and electrons are definitely not blue. Second of all, electrons don't circle around in uh, orbits like the, how it's pictured here. This is what we call the a planetary model of the atom, which is a very, very old representation, which is by no means truthful, but is useful for this story that I'm going to tell you today. So the first important thing you need to know, and this is true in general, is the you can uh, sort of divide the atoms in two main parts. The part at the center, we call that the nucleus. It's very small that has the vast majority of the mass of the, of the atom, and then the part around it, which is very, very large, but contains uh, almost a negligible amount of the um, mass of the atom, it is called the orbitals. Now, in the nucleus, there's something, in the orbital, something else. What is inside the nucleus? Inside the nucleus, you have two types of particles. We call them protons and neutrons and for the sake of clarity in this case i've represented the protons with red dots and the neutrons with black dots in the orbitals on the other hand you have a different kind of particle which is called the electron now before i move to the next slide i want you to take a good look at this representation and especially you want i want you to look at the number of particles of the different kinds you have in your atom. Uh, one important thing to remember, this is more or less the structure of every atom. What changes is really the number of these particles, the number of neutrons, the number of protons, and the number of electrons. And now comes the part which is really interesting for our story. Uh, remember, we're still talking about how we can explain static charge. So. Uh, the important thing here is that these particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons, they have different properties, okay? But the only one which really matters right now is something that we call electric charge, okay? And I will not discuss what electric charge actually is, but the important thing is they have it, okay? And more specifically, protons have 
a positive charge, okay? And we don't have just any positive charge, we have exactly a positive charge of plus one, okay? And it's actually quite um, easy to remember this because proton, no? stays with positive, so PP, that's actually quite easy to remember. On the other hand, neutrons, here you have, have zero electric charge. And here, this is something that a lot of people might, might mistake at the beginning because neutron sort of um, uh, sounds well with negative, but neutron actually comes from neutral, which means absent, without, zero. Okay, so we have protons, we have to have a um, uh, positive charge of plus one, neutrons, which have a zero electric charge, and electrons have a negative charge, exactly minus one. You can already see where we're headed to at this point. Now, we have uh, three types of particles, one doesn't have any charge, and the other two, they have exactly the opposite type of charge. So, what does it mean from a point of view of the overall charge of our carbon atom? Because remember, I'm, I'm doing a very specific sample. I'm talking about the carbon atom. At this point, uh, I can tell specifically that a carbon atom has exactly six protons in its nucleus. Uh, it has exactly six neutrons. I'm not telling you the whole story right now. There are different flavors, so to speak, or isotopes, which is the most correct way to say it, uh, with different amount of neutrons. But let's stick to the basic one, which has six neutrons. So we have six protons, we have six neutrons, and what is important, it has exactly six electrons. So we can sort of make... Uh, we can sort of um, add together the total charge of our atom. And this is exactly what we have here. The atom's total charge is plus six. No, it's plus one for each proton. So we have six protons, that means plus six. We have minus six. Why minus six? Because we have exactly six electrons and each electron has a negative charge of minus one, so that means minus six, and then plus zero, why plus zero? Because neutrons do not add any charge. And this is very simple math we have here, plus six minus six plus zero makes zero. And this is really important. Your normal atom has an overall charge of zero, despite being made of particles which have different charge, okay? But what is important, these charges are usually balanced. They are the same amount of one type and the same amount of the other type. At this point, you should already get an idea on how we can charge up things uh, in this static charge phenomenon. Now, let's put this, this information into the bigger picture how we can charge up things, how we can make static charge, how can we make a balloon so that it can att uh, attract small pieces of paper or do other stuff. The important thing, we have to start from a situation where the total charge, uh, the net charge, as we prefer to say, is zero. And this is uh, represented here with this picture. We have um, a wool sweater, and a balloon, where the, these red balls with a plus sign represent the positive charges, which basically means the protons, and the negative, uh, the, the minus inside the blue balls are the electrons, so the negative charges. And as you can easily see, they are in the same amount, the same amount here and the same amount here. That means this object is neutral has a net charge of zero. The same goes for the balloon. So right now, we have no static electricity whatsoever. So how we can make a charge? And here lies really the, uh, the core of the issue. Uh, one of the fundamental laws of physics tells that charge cannot be created or destroyed. 
Okay, we call this the conservation of charge. You might remember from previous years in physics, the conservation of energy. It's true also for electric charge. Also, the overall electric charge is conserved. You cannot make it uh, out of thin air. What you can do, however, you can move it around. Okay, so that is really how we can electrically charge something. So let's imagine now we take our neutrally charged balloon and we bring it next to our neutrally charged wool sweater and we start to rub it. Okay, up and down, up and down, up and down. And you might even hear some crackling sound, which is very typical of static charge. Now, what is happening at the level of the atoms? Now, this is another very, very important thing you have to remember. Uh, the positive charges stay where they are, okay? Uh, you cannot move around protons by rubbing things together. Protons are held in place by the strongest force in the universe. It's called the strong nuclear force. So it will stay there. You, you can't move them around. But what you can do, remember the layout of the atom. The atom has on the outside has this this um, a sort of shell of electrons. So the electrons are involved in this uh, scratching around, okay? So what you can do by rubbing the balloon against the wall, you can take away some of these electrons. So what happens at this point? As you can see in this drawing, you have now most of the negative charges from the wool sweater moved onto the balloon and not anyway this is also very important they're not just randomly distributed they are or or uniformly distributed they're all in the side where we were scratching our balloon you can also see that the positive charges are still in place the protons cannot move around okay so what is happening now the point is uh we haven't created new charge, but we have created an imbalance. We have taken the electrons, some of the electrons from the wool sweater, and now they're on the balloon. So the balloon has a net charge which is negative. On the other hand, we have, having taken away some of the electrons from the wool sweater, now the wool sweater has more positive than negatives. It doesn't have... It, and it's, this is not happening because we added more positive. We have taken away the negatives. So we also have an imbalance here. So the wool sweater now has a net positive charge. But now we have a negative charge on one side, a positive charge on the other side. And for static electricity, the same applies as for um, magnetism. Opposite attracts. So the balloon will tend to stick to the wool sweater. Now, uh, I can understand that this might be confusing at first, but I really, really encourage you to watch this video again. Um, I'm going to link also this animation. It's one of the virtual labs from FET at Colorado. So that's really, really helpful for you to understand this. And um, in class, we'll also have a chance to see other uh, effects which can be easily now explained in terms of electron transfer. But for today, that's all. Goodbye from Mr. Buscetti.